Welcome, this is the Atrium webinar series. We are about to start in a few minutes. This is the Atrium webinar series. We are about to start in a few minutes. Do you want to make your money work for you but find investment intimidating? Do you want to build towards a better future? With Atrium Group's funds, you can invest according to your interests and values. Investing is now made easier and affordable. Step into your future self, invest to reach your goals and aspirations. Matching your risk appetite and investment horizon has never been this easy. Let us help you maximize your earning potential by writing the growth story of the Philippine economy and opening your doors to the international trends and the global markets. Let us prepare you for a better financial future. At Atram, we're making lives better through investing. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Atram webinar series. I'm Gemma E your host from Atram Channel Management, and I am delighted to have all of you today. This webinar will focus on a timely and compelling topic, smart investing in a tech-driven world. With the rapid advancements in AI and machine learning and the recent impressive earnings from NVIDIA, there's no better time to explore the best strategies for investing in today's evolving landscape. As we delve into today's session, we aim to provide insights that can empower to make informed investment decisions for every one of you. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting out, we believe there's learning opportunity for everyone. Okay, so feel free to share your questions with us anytime by clicking on the Q&A button located below your screen. Yeah, so stay informed about our future events and receive important updates 
kindly take a moment to visit our official social media pages by scanning the QR code displayed on your screen. Additionally, a replay of today's session will be available on Atram YouTube channel. Just search for Atram Studio. You can also access our social media pages by scanning the QR code provided. You can also check our website at www.atram.com.ph for more comprehensive information on the market, finance, investments, and all the funds we provide. We'd like to keep this webinar as interactive as possible. So if you have burning questions on today's topic prior to this webinar, but have some clarifications or you just have some questions after the talk, don't hesitate, send it to us through the chat box. Okay? Uh, each question you send is a raffle entry for a chance to win limited Atram merchandise. Winners will be announced at the end of the webinar, so make sure to stay until the end. We will also be wrapping up with a quick feedback survey after the webinar, so we do hope that you'll share your thoughts with us about the session today so uh, we can further improve our future webinar series. Now, we're going to the exciting part. Please let me introduce our two esteemed guest speakers who will collaborate for today's session. Starting off with Mr. David Chow. David is a global market strategist for Asia Pacific X Japan at Invesco. With his array of experience and expertise, David is responsible for shaping Invesco's perspective on investment markets and the global economy. He provides strategic investment advice to financial professionals and clients across the region, making him the perfect guide for our discussion today. And we also have Ms. Ashley Orth. Ashley is a Senior Investment Strategy Analyst for the Global Market Strategy Team at Invesco. In this role, she develops and communicates economic outlooks and investment insights. Additionally, she researches and creates thought leadership pieces designed to help articulate the firm's thematic viewpoints. Ms. Oworth joined Invesco when the firm combined with Oppenheimer Funds in 2019. She began her career with Oppenheimer Funds in 2016 and worked with the investment strategy team. Previously, she worked at High Frequency Economics as a research coordinator. Ms. Orth has been in the industry since 2015. Ms. Orth earned a Bachelor of, Science of Arts degree in Economics and Political Studies from Bard College at Simons Rock. She also completed the Bard Globalization and International Affairs Program as part of her studies. So... Without further ado, let's dive into the world of smart investing with David Chow and Ashley Orth. Hello, David and Ashley. How are you doing today? You may now proceed. Hi, Gemma. Have the floor. Thank you, Gemma, for that lovely introduction. It is certainly a privilege uh, to be with you all today. I hope that uh, we can bring um, our insights um, both on AI, generative AI, the Magnificent Seven, the tech boom that we're seeing, um, and in ways that um, that you all can think about um, investing uh, in these longer term investment trends. Now, let me just kick off and say that um, AI um, is a topic that seems to really have penetrated all walks of life. It's really hard to avoid um, you know, in the news, uh, in the markets, um, and in everyday life. And I'm sure uh, most of you um, have thoughts about AI and how it has um, impacted you. Um, if we look at the stock market, um, anything remotely linked to artificial intelligence, um, especially semiconductors, uh, has really been powered on. And uh, today, the market capitalization, um, if we just look at just uh, the world's 27 largest 
semiconductor companies, it stands around 5.3 uh, trillion US dollars. Um, and, and that's actually around the same size as the entire global um, healthcare industry. Um, a lot of the gains that we've seen recently have come um, in just the past three months. So in this seminar, we will look at, you know, if, if, we, if those that haven't uh, benefited from the significant rise um, in tech shares, um, is there still room to go? Uh, what's the longer term outlook for the AI um, and the tech boom that we're seeing? Um, maybe some of the headwinds and the risks that could be associated um, for investing um, in this investment trend. And then ultimately we offer um, our, uh, what the investment implications um, can be. So at Invesco, we have been enthusiastically uh, vocal about the AI theme uh, for a while. Um, and we think that generative AI um, is a significant and powerful tool that is really propelling the next wave of tech innovation. Um, and it's really created a breadth of investment opportunities. Now, um, from an economist, economist point of view, um, estimates that generative AI could drive around a seven trillion US dollars in related global economic activity um, over the next 10 years. And that would boost productivity growth uh, by around one and a half percentage points annually. Uh, so this is significant from a top uh, um, macro perspective and the runway is long, we think around 10 years. So we think that the investor interest is justified uh, by this multi-year trend um, and we advise clients to position themselves um, appropriately. And in this seminar, uh, we'll give some, some ways on how to do that. So I have my colleague, um, Ashley, with me. She's based in London right now. She's really our guru uh, when it comes to AI, AI investment. So um, let me just have this fireside chat with her today. So Ashley, just kicking it off, um, can you just give us some real world examples of AI and how things, uh, how this technology um, is changing? Sure, and, and thank you, David, and thank you, Gemma, for, for having me and David on. This, this is a fantastic opportunity, I think, at the right time as well to really be talking about AI. Uh, now, truthfully, we've really been living through a sort of quiet revolution of AI already. Uh, we can see it in everything from internet searches to content product recommendation, uh, voice assistance, uh, text-to-speech, and, and more examples like these. And it was really uh, until the launch of ChatGPT that AI throughout our economy was really generally used to help us make decisions on rather specific questions. So for example, uh, what products should a website show to you based on your search history? Uh, what's the best route for you to get to uh, from, from point A to, to point B? Uh, and really it's also been used to help us understand data such as you know, identifying what words someone is saying, such as through uh, text-to-speech or, or dictation software. But now with generative AI, the game has really changed. Now AI can also be creatively productive. Uh, we can ask AI to, to write emails, uh, produce images, and, and more. It can be everything from a virtual customer assistant that's trained on a company's product or offerings, uh, and, and help consumers really navigate what's on offer or any problems they may be having. Uh, generative AI could also be effectively a, a librarian. They can help summarize research or really guide you through learning about a topic. Uh, or it could even be something as simple as uh, filling out the depth and detail of a video game character or a character on screen that you can almost interact with naturally. And the list goes on. The, the point is to say is that AI has really just reached this, this precipice where we're seeing it not just help us navigate information, but also process it, digest it, and present it back to us in a really, uh, I would argue, creative way. And I think that's, you know, in general, we believe we're really at the earliest stages of what might come from generative AI. I just um just touching on generative AI versus discriminative AI. You know, AI has been around actually for for decades right now, right? So so what specifically um sets generative AI um apart 
from regu from from dis discriminative AI? And why have we seen such a significant boom or boost um, in investor interest um, in generative AI? Sure, I, I think that you know those are, are very good questions. I mean, uh, discriminative AI is is really what we're familiar with already. Um, you know, we, we call discriminative AI. This is sort of a, a, a jargony kind of term, but what it essentially means is that we're able to discriminate between types of data, or differentiate, or categorize. In other words, we're able to make decisions with it. Uh, whereas generative AI, it's not just about making a decision, but it's understanding sort of patterns in data or linkages of them, so that when you ask a chatbot, for example, a question, that it knows what topic you're asking about. If you're asking some image generation software to give you, a, I don't know, a picture of a person riding a bicycle in a city, it sort of has memory of what those individual situations look like and how to put those things together. And that, that generative component, it's been around for a long time, but really it, it wasn't until just the past decade where we reached this uh, sort of critical mass of computing power and data um, and, and also model sophistication uh, that really enabled it to be uh, meaningfully competent. In other words, before it was sort of, you know, a, a very dumb thing to play with. It didn't give you impressive results. But with all these advances we've had steadily over time and with all the computing resources that we have, now we're seeing generative AI have its moments. And I think that ChatGPT, so that was late 2022, that really encapsulated what it's capable of. And I think the way in which it was packaged just helped this, this trend really uh, blossom into what we're seeing today. It felt very easy to interact with, very familiar, and, and here we are. <laughs> Got it, I mean, that, that seems quite clear to me. Now let's just pivot um, over to um, some of the price actions that we've seen um, in AI companies. Uh, how are AI companies approaching investing in the space themselves? Sure, I, I think that this is um, where we can sort of lay out a bit of a, a framework that there's sort of uh, buckets of companies that we can see in this space. Uh, we have a, a, this the slide share right now showing that we have this value chain mapped out. And really the, the key takeaways is that there's three major themes that emerge. It's that um, we have one bucket of companies that are really those that are uh, the enablers or the infrastructure, that they're helping power these tools and services. And then there's number two, that's the, the companies that are really uh, building the AI software itself. They're, they're doing this through you know, sophisticated tools, uh, depth of knowledge and detail. And then uh, of course, access to resources, which feeds back to the infrastructure point. And then finally, we have this third basket. It's really the ultimate adopters of this technology. And I'd argue that this is the area that probably sees uh, less attention in terms of price action today but it's where we really expect the most meaningful effects from AI. And this is where I think that as we see companies and consumers as well adopt AI tools and services that we can really see the, the greatest value creation in our economy. Now, I would say that um, this, this sort of uh, infrastructure companies, uh, right now, that's where we've seen much of the action. This is where uh, we're really focused on investing in expanded capabilities to train, uh, run, and maintain these sort of state-of-the-art models. Uh, you alluded earlier, David, to semiconductor stocks and the market capitalization there. This is where we're We're realizing as well that we need a substantial amount of uh, resources of hardware to make that happen. And so these, these infrastructure companies, they're really... Uh, they're really investing in those sort of raw resources that we need to help models become more sophisticated and powerful. But overall, when we're talking about investing in AI, we can really generally fit the, the, uh, you know, the themes or the buckets uh, into, into these categories. And I think each is really necessary to make AI happen. Got it. So as I say, a, a rising AI tide should lift all boats. And maybe right now it's just living, you know, lifting the yachts like the semiconductor yachts and maybe some of the other boats have <laughs> not yet been list, lifted. Right. So it seems like this um, this investment theme, there are other ways to invest um, in AI and not just in the most um, apparent ones such as semis or or um, GPUs or, you know, companies like NVIDIA. Right. 
Um, now, this really brings me to my next question. Let's think longer term. Um, what does the future for AI look like? Um, are we in the ninth inning already? Are we in the start of this innovative technology? Um, how might we see generative AI rolled out um, into the broader economy? I, I think that's a, a great question. So far, really, I think we've seen pretty um, overall primitive or simplistic examples of generative AI. I would say things like like ChatGPT, they're, they're really overall quite straightforward. I think that they're sort of giving you what the raw resources feel like, kind of like a, almost a toy to play with and experience what this software is capable of. Uh, but over time, we really expect to see more uh, focused and refined examples. Uh, so for example, um, the generative text tools, such as uh, as it's encapsulated in ChatGPT, they can really be used for things that are, you know, for example, uh, creating more personalized learning plans and resources, uh, really uh, uh, developing educational tools and resources that can uh, not just, you know, give you uh, information available on the web, but also be able to spoon feed it to you in such a way that you're able to make the most out of it and, and be able to, to retain that knowledge. Um, generative image tools, this is another area, and this can be used in a, a whole host of examples, everything from uh, photo editing. I know we've seen a lot of um, ads from smartphone companies, for example, just showing off some of the, the early examples of this uh, these, these tools in motion. Uh, but I, I can see this expanding as well to uh, to video editing, uh, really all sorts of multimedia use cases that can transform the way in which we interact and, and build content. Uh, we can also see um, like generative coding tools that can help us write programs and not just write programs, but also help us learn how to program ourselves. They can explain and interpret for us how a given selection of code is working and thereby make us you know, uh, better software engineers. And really, these are just a few examples. We have more that are shown on screen, but these tools, they can really, once applied to uh, more nuanced use cases that are, you know, in, in this case, rather industry specific uh, or, or specific to the type of data that we're working with, they can overall help us enhance user experiences. And I think overall provide more personalized tool sets. Great. Um, and, and just before I launch into my next question, I'd like to say that um, I'm seeing all these great uh, audience Q&A questions coming in. Um, please keep them uh, coming. Um, um, I will try to um, you know, incorporate some of these questions um, in our in our uh, moderated Q&A. Um, and so this really takes me to my next question. You mentioned that generative AI is, is used for so many different purposes already. Um, but we also hear, you know, in, or we read in the media that generative AI uh, could be used for nefarious uh, purposes, either if it's for, yeah, uh, you, know, um, you know, some geopolitical uh, purposes or for, um, you know, for fraudulent purposes or, you know, um, is this a technology that we should be somewhat um, uh, wary about, that we should keep at an arm's length? What are governments doing to protect um, consumers? Um, is there a moral component to this technology? Is it going to replace a lot of workers? Um, what are some of the key risks you think um, are associated with this? Uh, this such a, a meaty topic there. And I think that we'll probably devote the next few hours to really unpacking that. I think that there's so much to be said on, on you know, exactly all the, the challenges uh, along the way to actually making uh, AI happen. I think so far what we've laid out has been a really optimistic story and, and picture of what we may see from AI. But of course, like you mentioned, there are risks and there are, there are sort of, um, uh, uncomfortable uh, factors as well to really wrestle with for how this really affects society at large. And, you know, on this, on the screen here, we really laid out a few of them. And I say a few of them because, you know, this is um, already a pretty um, um, large slice of the pie of, of the, the challenges that we see ahead. But I think there, there's many more to be addressed. Like you said, you know, the, the front on, on misinformation and 
you know, the emerging cybersecurity risks that come along with having these generative AI tools out there, there, there's a lot to wrestle with. And of course, understandably, there's a lot of fear as well about how generative AI may affect workers, uh, especially in, in information heavy uh, services industries. Uh, personally, I, I tend to take comfort in the fact that though, uh, despite AI really being rolled out in so many ways across our economy already, uh, as I touched on earlier, we're still struggling today with rather tight labor markets across the much of the globe. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, with, with AI being uh, on the table now, you know, generative AI especially, I, I think that history has so far shown that there's still a substantial role for, for human labor that, you know, it's not really a matter of, you know, everyone's going to, you know, have their, their, their jobs automated away. Uh, I would argue that history, it's, it's really full of examples of, of new technologies uh, affecting and changing the jobs that are available to us. And as technology evolves, so does the role of labor, of, of what we do in our working lives. Historically, this has really meant a, a shift to higher value added jobs. So, uh, for example, uh, before the invention of the car, uh, there were many thousands of jobs that were devoted to caring for horses. But over time, of course, that labor was freed up for more productive purposes, for more you know, value add in our economies and therefore making us all richer in the process. And we expect really that AI will continue this trend. Uh, the way I like to ultimately frame it or think of it is that uh, AI won't replace me, but someone who knows how to use AI better than me might. And I think that's probably a good way of, of approaching uh, that sort of fear is that this is a tool set that we can harness, we can make use of. Uh, and I think that overall, it's not something we should necessarily be afraid of. Right. Um, I, and let me just add from my economist um, point of view is that we're, we're seeing a demographic slowdown or a cliff uh, in places in North Asia, uh, you know, China, Korea, uh, Japan. Um, and also in other uh, Western and industrialized countries. Um, and so how are you going to grow your economy if your population is ultimately shrinking? You can grow it through net population growth um, or prices, um, but you don't want inflation um, you know, to be above 2%, or you can grow it through productivity gains. And what is going to be the main driver for productivity for all these uh, large uh, major economies? I would actually argue it would come from AI. Um, and in a previous statistic, I cited that uh, AI is going to be driving productivity gains of around one and a half percentage points um, a year. And that is going to be pretty significant, which is why we're starting to see uh, governments like the U.S. and China start to put um, their money where their mouth is. And this is surprising for the U.S., uh, which has traditionally been kind of a laissez-faire, hands-off uh, government um, when it comes to industrial policy. Uh, now they have a, a very strong government-centered industrial policy, giving subsidies uh, to semiconductor companies and the like. So I think that perhaps the battle, the tech battle in the future um, would come from things like AI and robotics and, you know, um, you know, a lot of these tech uh, components um, with, with really um, AI at, at the forefront. Now, this, this moves me over uh, to the investment part of our discussion. So actually, uh, we've seen um, significant price movements upwards price movements um, in AI stocks, in semiconductor stocks. Um, are we in a bubble? I, I think that's that's a great question. Probably one of the, the dominant ones out there today. I, I see so many articles on a your daily basis just really questioning how far these stocks have, have run up. And <clears throat> I think it's pretty unavoidable that uh, AI-related stocks, they've, they've soared in value. This is true. And it's brought a lot of these sorts of comparisons to the, the 1999.com tech bubble. Uh, but I would say that, you know, things are quite a bit different once we look into the details. That back in 1999, uh, companies, they really soared in value as they got, got into this tech craze, this speculative frenzy that was built on these kind of, you know, lofty ideas, but really no results that underlied them. 
Uh, so in other words, we had big ideas, big promises, but not a lot of earnings to underpin that. Uh, but in contrast, today's AI leaders, these Magnificent Seven especially, uh, and I think them being a, a, probably a, an example for this space, these, these companies have existing robust business models. They're really powered by substantial earnings. Uh, as you can see in this chart uh, that we're showing here, if we measure the, the experience of, of stock prices versus earnings over the course of last year, we can see that yes, those AI related companies, they've really taken off, but they've also been where we've seen the revenue growth happening. Uh, the earnings growth has far outpaced the rest of, of US stocks. Uh, so I, I think that you know, saying it's a, a tech bubble, I think I'm, I'm hesitant to do that at this stage because we're really seeing the, the revenue capture happening uh, in, in a way that wasn't really comparable to past uh, speculative frenzies. So you know, I, I think that there's, there's more uh, room to run here that the, the earnings estimates uh, continue to be quite, quite bullish, quite positive. And so I'm not uh, I'm not ready to say that this is uh, you know this is overdone. Right. I I get questions from our investors. Uh, is there irrational exuberance in the magnificent seven stocks? Um, and I'd say no. There is actually rational exuberance. Why? Well, let's just look at the most recent earnings uh, results. Uh, the fiscal year 2023 or the last quarterly earnings um, are, are largely in and they've confirmed that the Magnificent Seven, they accounted for nearly all of the earnings growth in the S&P for last year. All, nearly all. Um, and additionally, um, you know, these companies continue to beat um, estimates, consensus earnings estimates. So if the E um, in your PE uh, continues to go up, then the valuation metric could justify um, being at an elevated level. Now, high expectations um, that we're seeing are really being backed up by strong results. Um, and we've seen the most recent earnings print and earnings guidance um, by one of the largest um, AI companies out there. So uh, given uh, their kind of elevated earnings and their valuations, uh, one could make a strong um, argument that, that the fundamentals, the strong fundamentals that, that are improving um, justify um, these uh, elevated um, valuations. And we continue to think that the MAG7 uh, may continue uh, to outperform. Now, let me just, uh, um, you know, uh, pivot this conversation over um, to um, another part of discussion. So, Ashley, um, AI is known uh, for being a very resource intensive tool. Um, and there's been some criticism um, that it requires a lot of electricity and energy and expensive hardware. Uh, for training and running models. So uh, how can we use AI uh, given these challenges? How do we get around um, you know, these challenges about AI using lots of electricity? Yeah, I, I think you know, some of what we've laid out has been a lot of excitement in semiconductor stocks, and that's because they're using so much hardware, in other words, computing resources, or in other words, electricity, uh, to, to make these sophisticated models happen. And I would I think that's the, the takeaway here is that because there is this unavoidable cost that goes into producing uh, and also running these AI tools, that it means that AI is not necessarily suited for every single purpose. It's not like we can, you know, AI everything, uh, but rather, you know, I, I would expect that especially from the, the business use case lens, that where we see AI implemented would be in where it has the, the best value add uh, proposition. That's the calculus works in, in, in favor of you know, being an add end rather than a subtraction uh, to, to a, a company's performance or, or you know, just to, to how we're interacting with the, the tool. Uh, so that's, that's I think the, the primary point I want to make. But the second point I'd like to add on top of that is that once these tools are, are developed, there are ways of tweaking them to make them more efficient. That there are some, you know, for example, they're referred to as large language models like, like ChatGPT. Uh, these things tend to be very resource intensive, 
But there's another way of building them that once you have that structure essentially intact, that you can make a, a tool that its running costs on an ongoing basis are actually far lower. Uh, so in other words, you put in that initial upfront uh, cost to, uh, to make that, that AI tool uh, uh, feasible, and then you're able to essentially produce an efficient version of it. Uh, and I, I think that there's a lot of room here for, in other words, optimization, that it doesn't always have to be so resource intensive, that it is something that we can make efficient over time. And I would argue in the history of technology, we've seen this happen countless times. You know, the, the very first car, for example, couldn't go faster than 15 miles per hour and use a huge amount of gas. And I think that, you know, over time, we've seen that calculus shift, that we have more power for less. And I think that that can happen here as well. Uh, again, you know, cars are just one example, but there's there's hundreds of, of, uh, of such uh, um, cases from history where we can see that playing out. So I'm, I'm not put off by the, the cost element, and I think that will improve over time. So maybe my last question to you is, um, what do you think could upturn uh, the Apple cart or what could drive, what could impair um, the current upwards movement um, in AI stocks or investor interest um, in AI or MAG7 um, stocks? I think that it's it's a matter of, you know, as I touched on earlier, a lot of the price action so far has really focused on uh, building these tools, but I think that we've seen fewer implementations of these tools. And I do think a lot of those are underway, but I think that there's probably a timing catch up that needs to happen uh, that we need to um, get from uh, sort of point A to point B. Point A being that we have all these resources to work with. And I would say the intermediating point is that we have um, a lot of development that's underway in the background to, to really produce more refined generative AI tools. And then once we get to that point B, this, this final destination where we see that this, uh, these AI tools roll out in the economy, that's where I think the, the exciting stuff happens. And I think that um, there may be um, you know, some fr frustrations perhaps with the timing of that, uh, or uh, maybe um, you know, there, there's a, an element of that a cost picture to evolve over time such that uh, it's, it's more uh, attractive or feasible for more companies to, to get into this space. Uh, so maybe it's a, a, a timing uh, element, but again, we expect a lot of this change to happen over the next 10 years or so. I don't think it's going to be a uh, tomorrow thing that it'll happen in a, a, a very quick moment, but rather uh, it'll play out over the next uh, decade. But that's not to say that it's not already happening. I think that we are fully in this, this transition. I think from my perspective, um, from an economist perspective, uh, these stocks or, or this this significant rally that we've seen, um, what could pour cold water? I, I think if the Fed uh, tightened, uh, if they tighten monetary policy, if they raise interest rates from here, that could certainly impair a lot of high flying um, you know, stocks with, with um, elevated valuations. Or if the the U.S. CPI print, um, uh, which we recently got out, uh, you know, started to reaccelerate, uh, it's we've seen a bit of stickiness. Although the longer term uh, trudge is towards a downwards movement, if that started to reverse, I think that could certainly uh, recalculate some investors' expectations. Um, or things like geopolitics between China and Taiwan, if that started to heat up. Or, you know, if there was a, um, sh you know, shrill rhetoric coming from a, a Trump, a potential Trump uh, 2.0 presidency, um, you know, so I think that these are concerns um, that that are on that I keep in the back of my mind. But from what we've seen so far, um, you know, the Fed continues to we expect the Fed um, and also recent comments from Jay Powell um, in his testimony to Congress show that, you know, the Fed Fed plans to cut rates uh, later this year. Um, and that's because inflation is coming down. The US economy is in a disinflationary um, environment. Um, and also, I think um, that 
that investors are able to see through some of the bumps that we might get, you know, from the inflation data. But overall, the U.S. economy remains, um, you know, quite resilient, um, and the Fed is able to cut rates, uh, you know, because inflation is coming down. I think this environment, this macro backdrop, um, continues to be quite conducive um, for AI and Mag Seven stocks. Um, and so this kind of ends our moderated fireside chat component of the conversation. Um, I'd like to pass it back uh, to um, our moderator. Thanks. Um, Gemma, if um, if you'd like, I can look at yeah, some yeah. of the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, David. Thank you, David and Ashley, for sharing valuable information and insights about the AI space. Your expertise and analysis have truly shed light on a topic that's at the forefront of investment discussions globally. We've learned that the discourse surrounding AI is rich and multifaceted, incorporating its transformative potential across various sectors and industry. Okay, so what did you say? We would go on to the Q and A. Oh, maybe a little bit. Is that okay with you, David? Sure. Okay. Okay. So let's, as we conclude, it is clear that the technological landscape is rapidly evolving, shaping the way we consume and invest. From the transformative impact of five G technology to the exponential growth of e commerce, video gaming and subscription-based models. Opportunities abound for investors seeking to capitalize on emerging trends. Okay, that's why we invite you to consider the Atrium Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund. You know, one thing I love about this fund, this is strategically poised to capture the growth potential of digital life and experiential consumption, offering opportunities for aggressive investors who are willing to embrace short-term volatility for the prospect of long-term potential returns. Whether you're planning for retirement, inheritance, or simply growing your wealth, this fund presents a compelling opportunity to align your investment strategy with the evolving landscape of consumer behavior. So let us take the opportunity you know, to step forward, securing your financial future, and join us in investing in the next big trend. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to embarking on this exciting journey together. I'm sure you're all excited no, to proceed with the question and answer segment, but before anything else, let me share with you some of Atrum's latest achievements. Okay, in 2023, Atrum has achieved Re remarkable success being honored with prestigious awards that recognize our dedication to excellence and innovation in the investment industry. Building on this momentum, we are delighted to announce that Atram has been acknowledged for its commitment to excellence in 2024. Atram was awarded with the Leading Asset and Wealth Manager in the Philippines 2024 title from the World Business Outlook Awards, as well as the leading asset management company in the Philippines 2024 award from the International Business Magazine Awards. Furthermore, we are pleased to have received the title of Asset Manager of the Year here in the Philippines from the Fund Select Asia Awards 2024. Additionally, our commitment to innovation and providing top-notch investment solutions has been recognized with awards for Leading Innovative Asset Management Company here in the Philippines 2024 and Leading Investment Solutions Provider Philippines 2024 from the Global Brand Awards 2024. These awards stand as a testament to our unwavering dedication to delivering cutting-edge investment solutions and assisting our clients in achieving their financial goals. We owe this success to the determined efforts of our team, experts, who is consistently pushing the boundaries of what is achievable and in the investment industry. 
We extend our heartfelt gratitude to our valued clients and partners for their unwavering confidence and support us. Rest assured, we remain steadfast in our commitment to excellence and innovation as we continue our journey to redefine the landscape of asset management and um, fund. And thank you very much for being part of the success story of Atram. Okay, so now this is it. We will now proceed to the Q&A session. Please feel free to send your questions in the chat box. Our speakers will be happy to address them. Let's start off with this question. I'm seeing one here. Okay, so maybe David, can you answer this first? Or Ashley, whoever wants. As AI continues to evolve, what are the emerging trends or developments in the investment space that investors should be aware of? Great. Ashley, do you want to take that first and I can supplement? Uh, sure. I think that um, there's there's probably a lot of different directions we could go with this. I think that um, one area that I think is particularly interesting is that um, part of what goes into building AI tools is that they use a huge amount of data. And I think that um, I mean, there's, there's a lot we could say on data for sure, but I, I think that one of the, the risks that's been highlighted is who has rights over that data. In other words, how does uh, generative AI really affect this intellectual property debate? And I think it's interesting that there's actually a lot of offerings that are um, cropping up that actually seek to sidestep this issue by using uh, sort of proprietary databases for training AI tools. And in other words, they're able to offer uh, outputs that are free from any of those concerns and therefore attractive uh, to businesses. So I think that's one very interesting area uh, where, where we're seeing uh, sort of an emerging trend, uh, at least in the business landscape. I would say as well that there's a lot of frustrations or concerns with the potential for bias arising out of AI systems. Uh, for example, like recruiting software uh, that can help go through a, a large number of candidates very quickly uh, has been shown to actually exhibit biases based on the data it was initially uh, trained on or initially built from. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's that's another area where we'll see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, upcoming work and, and development to try to address those issues. And I think that once somebody is able to get that, that formula, that picture, uh, that tool right, uh, I think that's that's another area that we could really see um, uh, some potential for uh, for a, a select number of AI uh, uh, related companies really take off. Uh, I'm sure I could come up with with more examples, but sure, David, please step in. Um, let me say from an investment perspective, uh, we've seen AI stocks in the U.S. move significantly. Um, but I think that there is momentum left in proxy plays in places like Korea, Taiwan, um, because these indexes uh, have meaningful market share to AI related companies. So, for example, around 63 percent of Taiwan's market cap has some exposure to AI. Uh, which is the largest in the APAC region, uh, while Korea's market cap comes um, in second around 44%. Um, now, so with generative AI stocks and related beneficiaries in Asia, um, they're trading at a discount um, to their US peers. So I think that there is opportunity there. Also, I think small to mid cap um, AI stocks that have not seen the boom. We've only seen the boom in like large cap um, AI and Mag7 stocks. We haven't seen. I think that that's going to trend downwards. Uh, we'll see a broader um, rally um, in these small to mid cap stocks. And I think that Korea, um, uh, Taiwan uh, indexes stocks are, are likely to do well this year too. Okay. Thank you, David and Ashley. That's very great insights. And I have an interesting question here. Uh, let me read it to you. Some analyst commentators suggest that there may soon be rotation out of the tech sector into small caps or emerging markets. Your thoughts on this, please? Well, we last week was interesting because um, we saw um, the S&P 500 um, and also 
um, some of the tech stocks uh, take a downwards leg, some pressure, uh, while um, U.S. mid-cap stocks actually rallied. So what does that mean? Well, I, I think that it's possible um, as investors start to consider um, uh, you know, the monetary path forward for the Fed, we expect to see a Fed cut um, in the second quarter. That should certainly be, um, be conducive to cyclical stocks and also um, small to medium um, um, capital, uh, capitalization stocks. So we think that the rally, which has been quite narrow, we think that it will broaden uh, later on in this year, and especially as the U.S. moves from kind of this contractionary part of the economic cycle uh, towards a more recovery side. We think that um, uh, this should boost um, kind of more early stage uh, recovery, um, you know, stocks. Mm, I agree with that, David. I have a follow up question. Given the challenges to AI adoption. Should we still trust AI when it comes to investing or simply putting money in the investments products? I, I think that AI or I think technology, especially U.S. tech, um, at, over time from a long term perspective, it is a it is a very good um, investment. Um, whether you think this is the AI um, boom that we've seen is a bubble or not, or, you know, but, but if you dollar cost average from a longer term perspective, I think that this is a very good opportunity. Um, and it's, it's almost impossible to market time, right? When you, you, you know, uh, when you try to buy at the bottom and sell at the top, uh, we've seen numerous studies that show that this never works. Uh, normally people do the opposite, right? Uh, so what makes sense is that investors should be um, should be investing uh, consistently over a longer period of time. That really uh, works out for investors. Yeah, I agree. Because most people become afraid, anxious during the market fall. But yeah, I agree with you. You should uh, really invest for long-term goals, right? Okay. I would also add on to that, that um, you know, when it comes to the challenges to, to AI adoption, I, I think that one of the things that comes up in my mind, at least on, on this topic, speaking more specifically about the technology is that there's a number of shortcomings that have been highlighted, especially in the media about how AI can, can behave. And, and I think that these things are, from my perspective, all addressable. It's, it's a matter of whether it's in an investment process where you may be using artificial intelligence uh, or if you're using AI for some other use case, uh, it, it's a matter of, what role in decision making it's given and the sort of questioning of the results that it gives you. Uh, and I think that there's there's all ways to uh, to implement this in a way that it can be a, a value add uh, and and a, you know ultimately a, a good addition. Uh, it's not just a, a company in terms of investing in AI, but also in terms of a portfolio of getting exposure to the AI trend at large. Yeah, diversification is really great. Isn't it, Ashley? Yes. I would agree. Yeah. Now, the next question is for me. Oh, my. Someone is asking, what sets the Atrium Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund apart from other investment funds targeting similar themes? And why should the investors consider this, this fund as a part of their portfolio diversification strategy? Well, let me answer that by sharing with you, I mean, the audience, some reasons why you would want to invest in Atrium Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund and why and what sets it apart from other investment funds with similar theme. So first, this, is, this fund is flexible. It recognizes the digital lifestyle, that, that digital lifestyle is here to stay. And also, our consumption will continue to change with the times and the fund is ready to find and latch on to the next big thing. In our next fund provides you access and diversification. Access to these global companies of which we consume but normally have no access to. The focus of uh, this fund is consumer tech or, real, or tech enabled consumer goods and services. So for example, in e-commerce, the likes of Lazada and Shopee here in the Philippines but currently, 
the fund holds Shopify and Mercado Libre. We also have video gaming like Take Two, the makers of NBA 2K. Or the, or the Nintendo, the makers of Mario and Pokemon, as well as the apps we use regularly like Netflix and Facebook. Moreover, it allows us to diversify our portfolio going for a team that is poised to work whenever we consume. And the truth is, we consume a lot. Hence, Atrium Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund would be able to enhance our whole investment portfolio. So, with that, I invite you to, uh, no, to invest. Try Atrium Global Consumer Trends Feeder Fund. Okay? So, our next question. Ashley and David, whoever wants to answer this, is investing in cloud computing and data centers a good strategy? I would argue uh, that, um, that that sort of approach is uh, very relevant to the, the AI ecosystem because, again, it's sort of the, the raw resources that we need uh, to, to really train and run AI tools on an ongoing basis. That, you know, if you're thinking about, for example, a lot of these magnificent seven companies, they're making use of, if they don't already have it in-house, they're making use of external providers that are able to give them the computing resources and data storage capacity that they need to actually make AI systems uh, in the first place. So I, I would argue, yes, it's it's a, a good method of exposure to this theme. Uh, and I think that, again, part of that sort of diversified approach to uh, having exposure to uh, artificial intelligence and the economy at large, this is uh, one great method of, of doing that. Yes, that's correct. And related to that question also, how is AI being leveraged in the investment sector to enhance decision-making processes? I, I think that there's um, a lot of examples actually already from AI uh, prior to, to the emergence of generative AI where it's being used across a, a wide range of functions, everything from how we generate capital market assumptions to how we understand you know, economic growth and the factors involved in it, uh, to you know, when we're just analyzing a company, that we can use artificial intelligence as another tool in our toolkit uh, to you know, analyze and prepare information, everything from financial statement analysis to you know, what consumers are doing uh, in, in the economy. So I think that, uh, you know, this is a very broad level comment that I'm giving right here, uh, but I've seen a lot of these tools at work uh, that make use of, of, of these systems. You know, if you're familiar with, you know, uh, some basic quantitative analysis, such as uh, a linear regression, that's just like the, the, the tip of the iceberg of what's uh, uh, possible when we dive into machine learning and artificial intelligence. So yes, absolutely, it's involved in the investment sector. And I think we'll continue to see those capabilities evolve as AI systems become more familiar to investment professionals, uh, as well as uh, more robust and suited to, to our individual needs. In short, make AI our friend, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. it, will, it will benefit us, whether in investing or growing your knowledge, correct? Okay, so I'd like to thank our audience for the very active participation. So we still have three questions. Okay, so with AI becoming increasingly integrated into various industries, how do you envision its impact on job roles and the future of work? So um, I, I can uh, take this question. David, please, please feel free to, to jump in. So there's um, a few different buckets that we sort of see AI playing out in, you know, in, in job roles in the future of work. And that is, I like to refer to them as like the three A's. So there it's it's an uh, assistive tool, it's an automative tool, and it's an augmentative tool. And in other words, what I mean by that is that it can help us in approaching our day-to-day -day tasks uh, by being an assistant. It can automate the sort of low effort mundane tasks that we hate doing or um, you know, or maybe time consuming, but not really very interesting to be uh, to be carrying out. Um, and then 
it can really help us sort of unlock new frontiers with what we're able to do at, in our work lives. Uh, there's been studies that have shown, for example, that um, people who play uh, chess have actually been able to improve faster by using computer opponents uh, rather than using uh, human opponents. And this is because it encourages them to act in a more theoretically uh, maximized manner and therefore really compete in the big leagues. And while that's sort of a, an example from, from uh, uh, just, just chess, I, I think that that goes to show that there's sort of um, the possibilities that are unlocked along the way when we're making use of these AI tools. So again, the sort of assistive, the automative, and the augmenting uh, capabilities of AI is really how I see the future of work unfolding from here. Yes, I agree. I, That's those AI tools enrich our daily lives. Yes, David, are you saying something? Sure, yeah. I, I would say that we have all asked ourselves um, this come to Jesus question. Will AI replace us, our, our job? Um, and or, or what is it about our job that can be replaced by a machine? Um, and sometimes, you know, it can be a very stark a realization that maybe a lot of what we do uh, could be simplified um, or could be generated. Um, like if, you know, especially, you know, I write a lot um, and I think that a lot of it could be, could be done, you know, by a generative AI machine. But at the same time, um, there are many services jobs in the world. If you think about it, you know, from, from people that cut hair, you know, there's over 4 million barbers, you know, um, in the world. Uh, there, there are lots of jobs that cannot be replaced, even on the lower end um, of, of the spectrum um, by generative AI. And those jobs will remain. Now, there will be a significant or a meaningful number of jobs that could be displaced. Um, but I think that this, this could potentially free up um, labor to go into more productive areas um, of the economy. Or if it's um, you know, being displaced in, in uh, more industrialized countries, it, it can go um, in other places. So labor, I think, is kind of like a balloon. You squeeze it in one place, then the air goes to another place. I don't think that we're going to see um, an instance where generative AI or AI is going to, um, you know, cause significant layoffs or unemployment in, in any economy. Yes, I agree, David. So moving forward, the next question is for me. So how to invest in the fund? So thank you for showing interest in the fund. We invite you to explore our website at www.atram.com.ph to know more about our products including the Atrium Global Consumer Trends Heater Fund. This fund is also available in the platform of Seedbox, Gcash, and Maya. Later, we will also flash a video about how to invest in the fund. Okay. Or now, we're going to the last question. Considering the fund's focus on digital life and experiences, how does AI factor into the fund's strategy for selecting investments within these thematic areas? Ashley, David? Sure, I, I can hop in there. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a variety of ways in which AI really promises to, uh, to enrich and, and transform our lives. And I think that, um, you know, one such example is in the area of, of gaming, that there's a, a lot of capabilities that can be unlocked with the emergence of generative AI, uh, whether that's sort of uh, in the, the capacity of, of world building, in other words, you know, being able to, to interact with characters that are created in a world based on sort of, you know, like character traits that are sort of like the director's cue for how it should behave and a generative AI chatbot sort of inserted into that. And on top of that, you can use generative voice tools that can be used to uh, not just use that text that emerges from that, but also speak it to, uh, to, to a player. And I think that you know, that's just one example of how we can uh, see AI sort of uh, enriching an experience. I think that we can find that in a variety of different um, um, uh, uh, spaces within just how uh, we interact with technology where we can see AI really factor into, um, you know, what is possible and what is uh, uh, on offer, whether it be product offerings, 
uh, on business business landscape or ultimately what consumers are able to do with those those tools. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm personally really excited for what what the future holds here. Mm -hmm. I'm I would excited. say. Uh, sure, sure. Go ahead, David. Um, from my perspective, um, if I had to only look at one economic data point um, or ask CEOs or investors um, one data point um, in, in the future of where I should be putting my money, I'd say, like, where are you investing your money? Where is the capital expenditures going? Um, and we're, you know, if you ask any CEO from any large to medium sized company, they all have investment plans uh, for mm -hmm. using AI and how AI can help, uh, you know, bring productivity gains uh, to their business. Um, even tech companies, even the large, um, you know, you know, tech companies, they, they may be laying off workers, but they're laying off workers because they're investing um, in their AI capabilities, right? Um, so I, I think that, um, so if you, if you want to know, does this have a longer term runway? Are there legs? I say yes, because investments are being poured in, um, you know, from companies, both small and large. And I think that certainly um, marks the start of a, of, a, of a long, you know, kind of cyclical um, upstart in capital expenditures and AI, um, which could last, you know, for years, maybe up to 10 years. Yes, I agree. Great insights, David and Ashley. I think that is all the time we have for questions. Before we end this Q&A, any final thoughts and insights that you would like to share to our audience, David and Ashley? Sure, I, I would, I, I guess, conclude by saying that, um, you know, we started with sort of discussing that AI is it's already in our economy in, in so many ways. But really, I think that we're, just at the beginning of what we can see from generative AI specifically, uh, this is really, it's, it's a new and powerful tool set as we've been going over. And I think we'll continue to see this to be developed and, and rolled out. And I think it's, I guess, worth remembering that uh, today's generative AI offerings, they're really a, a sandbox to show what's possible. And that from here, there's a lot more to come in my view. I would say, um, you know, are AI stocks expensive? Uh, yes. Um, have you missed out on, if you haven't invested in the MAG7 or AI stocks, have you missed the boat? I, I don't think so. Um, I still think that there's um, there's more room to run because the fundamentals, if you look at the earnings, if you look at what the CEOs of these companies are saying, um, the fundamentals are very strong. And ultimately as an investor, that's what you should be caring about. Um, are the fundamentals, are these companies generating cash? Are they beating and raising their earnings estimates? And we're seeing that um, happen. So I think that for investors with a longer term horizon, um, this certainly is a trend and investment theme that is worth uh, looking at closely. Yes. And we as investors will just have to be patient and continuously investing uh, through, through the time that we need the money, right? For the long term goals. Okay, thank you very much, David and Ashley. To our participants, we hope you were able to gain valuable insights from the two esteemed guest speakers we have today. So again, thank you so much, David and Ashley. And now, for a comprehensive overview of all the funds we provide, we invite you to explore our website at www.atram.com.ph. Feel free to visit for more detailed information. Did we mention that for as low as 1,000 pesos, you can already jumpstart your investment journey? Let's watch how we can start to invest in Atrum Funds. Good day. If you are interested in investing with Atrum, the leading independent asset and wealth management company in the Philippines, please visit our website, www.atrum.com.ph. We have all the details you would need to know about our funds. If you would like to start investing, click Invest Now. For further assistance and account opening, you may email our client services team. If you have more questions, visit the website's Frequently Asked Questions page or Atrum Academy page. We hope this helps. Thank you. Okay, apart from that, 
We also have Atom Prime. Atom Prime offers access to a diverse array of investment options. These options empower you to tailor your portfolio according to your specific goals and risk tolerance. Committed to long-term growth, Atom Prime's expert fund managers utilize proven investment strategies, guiding you towards the creation of enduring wealth. For more detailed information, please feel free to watch the video displayed on your screen. Good day. Atrum is the leading independent asset and wealth management company in the Philippines. If you are interested in investing in Atrum Prime, download the app in the Apple App Store or in Google Play Store. You can also visit prime.atrum.com.ph to know about Atrum Prime. If you have other questions, you may fill out the contact form on our website or send an email. We hope this helps. Thank you. There you have it. If you want to learn more about Atram Prime, visit the website prime.atram.com.ph or download the app now. You may download it in Google App or Google Play Store or Apple App Store. Okay, now as promised, here is the winner of our Atram merchandise. The winner is Leander Romero. Okay. So we will contact you through the details you provided during the registration on how to receive the prize. Okay. Once again, kindly please take a moment to visit and scan the QR code that you are seeing on your skin on your screen to access our official social media pages. You can catch a replay of today's session on Atrum's YouTube channel. Just search Atrum Studio. And you can also check our website at www.atrum.com.ph for more comprehensive information on the market, finance, investments, and all the funds we provide. Lastly, we would greatly appreciate if you could participate in the survey at the end of this webinar. Your thoughts on today's topic are important to us. On behalf of everyone at Atrum, Thank you for attending today's session. We extend our best wishes to continue for continued health and safety to you and your loved ones. Have a wonderful day.